Hello, welcome folks. Um, we'll be getting this uh, integration and marketplaces track in about three minutes or so. Hi, folks that are just joining. Um, we're uh, waiting for um, our speaker, Shelby, to, to join us, and then we'll get started. Um, this is the API integrations and marketplaces track, and uh, we're going to be kicking off talking about healthcare. Oh, Shelby's here. Shelby, you need to hit the share my audio and video button at the top, and uh, and then you'll be in the room. There you are. <laughs> hello. Hello, hello. Um, so, Shelby's going to be talking about um, healthcare interoperability. Actually, a topic that um, her and I have uh, collaborated on a little bit in the past. I could say collaborate is probably too strong a word. She has contributed um, to a report that I write um, called The State of API Integration. So, um, this is uh, a great topic. I'm excited to hear um, where the world has taken us since uh, since we last discussed this. It's good to see you. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, we're kind of uh, past our official start point, so I'm just going to hand it over to you. The the share button to share your screen is um, that other little icon with the the line through it there. Okay. And uh, when you're ready, I will pass the stage to you. Okay, great. Can you see my first slide? We can. Perfect. All right, so I'll go ahead and get started. Excellent, thank you much. All right, so um, my name is Shelby Switzer. I'm here to talk about healthcare interoperability from buzzword to APIs. I'll just start by giving you a little bit of background about me. Um, my handle on Twitter is Switzerly if you wanna chat at me later. Um, I'm currently a software engineer with the United States Digital Service, specifically stationed at the Department of Health and Human Services. You can check us out at usds.gov. And our Twitter handle, USDS, is just at USDS. Um, just a little bit of background about USDS. We are a nonpartisan agency within the White House. We were started by President Obama. And um, we came out of the um, And we are essentially a bunch of private sector technologists who have brought their expertise into government for term-limited service, so from anywhere from one to four years. 
um, and we work with agencies to help them modernize their technology, fight fires, and build new user-centered products. Um, I also have a background generally in civic tech and healthcare integrations and interoperabilities and APIs overall. Um, and I have my own civic tech blog, civicunrest.com, where I write when I'm not heads down in projects. So why am I here? I'm here because we are two decades um, or, and more into healthcare technology innovation. We are 10 years past meaningful use and the mandate that technology and electronic health records has to be interoperable. Um, but we're still seeing that healthcare technology is not interoperable and it's not user focused. And this is a huge burden, not only on patients, but on the American public. And I don't know about y'all, but for me, you know, the past few months have felt like many years. Um, and I'm here partly too, because I've been working on um, some specific projects related to the COVID response um, from a government perspective. And I've known that healthcare interoperability has been a big problem for a long time, but I've really seen how difficult it is during our current pandemic response to have to deal with the very real problems of data exchange and data interoperability. Um, so this picture is a picture of clinical data, case data, lab results that are piling up at a local jurisdiction, a public health department, and they have to be faxed by one person to other jurisdictions to help manage cases and help respond to the virus. And this is a reality that so many people across the United States and probably the world are facing is that just to exchange basic data about people who are being affected, who are affected by the virus um, is, is still a paper process. And even when it's systems based, there's still some level of manual intervention that has to happen. And it's been um, incredibly both depressing to see um, unsurprising uh, based on what I'd already known about healthcare coming into this, um, but in some ways also really inspiring to see the amount of hard work and creativity uh, that people at all levels of the data collection spectrum and all levels of the pandemic response, um, the creativity that they've employed to get past some of these hurdles. So today what I'm gonna talk about is I'm gonna talk about interoperability and APIs in healthcare, um, the journey to interoperability, how we get from the concept of interoperability to APIs, um, because I'm gonna argue that interoperability isn't enough. So what is interoperability in healthcare? Well, we can start with a noun. Um, the dictionary definition from Merriam-Webster is the ability of a system, such as a weapon system, to work with or use the parts or equipment of another system. So weirdly, every dictionary I looked in used the weapon system as an example. I don't know why. Um, luckily, we're not talking about weapons, we're talking about healthcare. Um, and I think that in general, um, you know, this is a good, a good place to start from, but from a software perspective, you know, we are talking about interoperability as the ability of a system to work with or use parts or functionality of another system. And from a modern software perspective, what we talk about usually when we talk about interoperability is APIs. And we also talk about standards. So even HTTP, JSON, XML, um, to more advanced protocols and standards like OAuth, um, standards are kind of a big part of the interoperability conversation, as well as usability. So we can talk about the message format and how data is structured and shaped and how it's sent, but the data itself also has to be usable. Um, it has to be usable in the way that it's structured and sent, and also just has to be good data. Uh, does it have identifiers? Is it linked if you're getting multiple sets of tabular data? Do you know what the fields mean? And then also when we talk about interoperability, we usually have some consideration of security, um, authorization, authentication, um, making sure that there, there are considerations around security and uptime and performance um, from a service perspective as well as just an access perspective. So this shouldn't be new to you. I've probably heard of these things. It's probably how you talk about APIs. Um, and that this is the case in most modern software industries, which is that the conversation isn't really about interoperability. In fact, I hardly ever hear that word outside of healthcare because the conversation is about APIs and it's about API strategy and lifecycle management. And that can look like this. Um, so this is a diagram of what API lifecycle looks like from Red Hat, thanks Red Hat. Um, and you know, there's a lot of steps to it. And I think there's some things to note here. Um, and this again is probably also familiar to a lot of people in the crowd. Um, some important things to note here are that this is a continuous cycle of product development. 
the why is present from the beginning to the end. We start with strategy and we end with monetization. So we're always thinking about why we're doing this. Um, we incorporate standards into things in the sections like design. We have users as part of this cycle. Um, we have a specific um, specific step for consumption and like getting users on board. Um, we're also potentially getting user feedback during this design and mocking and testing phase. Um, they're not just some assumption. Users aren't some kind of, you know, we, we just assume there's going to be users and hopefully we'll plan for them later and we'll get feedback from them. Um, it, it's actually just a real part of the cycle. That's something to call out here. And finally, discovery and promotion matter. Um, so number nine, discover. So people have to discover your API. You have to make your API discoverable. You want people to be using it, um, which is not necessarily the case of some APIs we see in healthcare, interestingly enough. So in healthcare, interoperability does not equal APIs. Healthcare interoperability um, is much more narrowly focused. This comes from HEMS. So HEMS is the Healthcare Information and Management System Society. They run a big conference every year that unfortunately was canceled this year due to the pandemic that's happening, obviously. Um, and this is how th they have published the thinking around interoperability. And it's not just them. This is just how people are thinking about it whenever you have conversations in healthcare about interoperability. Um, we're talking about four levels. Foundational, so basic requirements to securely communicate data between systems. Structural, um, format, syntax, organization of the data exchange. Semantic, underlying resource models, codification of the data, shared definitions and vocabulary, as well as organizational, which is the governance, policy, social, legal, and organizational considerations. And what this looks like in implementation are unfortunately a bunch of acronyms. Uh, that's just healthcare and government, sadly. Uh, so at the foundational level, we could be talking about HTTPS, we could be talking about setting up VPN connections, SFTP and FTPS. Um, structurally, we're talking about things like CSV, EDI, XML, and JSON. Um, and we're also kind of getting into some more interesting stuff like HL7, V2, and um, unfamiliar, HL7 is a standard for data exchange in healthcare. Um, and V2 is basically EDI, and V3 is XML-based. Um, and they these formats basically define the structure in which you send data um, and health messages. Um, and they kind of bleed over into the semantic. Um, so that's why I have them in semantic as well, um, because they do define certain elements, and they have some expectations around what goes where and what those things mean. However, those things, those rules are so loosely applied that in reality, they're not very much help semantically. And just because you implement HL7 v2.5.1 doesn't mean that you actually are sharing semantics with another system that does the same thing. Um, at a semantic level, we do see FHIR making more of an effort towards that and defining resource models um, and trying to get towards standardization in a more modern way. Um, and we also have the new USCDI, which is the United States Core Data for Interoperability, which is part of the Cures Act that just came out. And we can talk, we're going to talk about that a bit more later, um, but that's essentially defining data elements um, that are required for any sort of interoperable data exchange. Um, and finally, organizationally, we're talking about business associates agreements, memorandum of understanding, consent forms, policy compliance, et cetera. So you might notice um, that in terms of interoperability, you don't actually need an API for any of this. Uh, you can have a CSV that's standards-based and that's shared over SFTP with all the right BAs in place, and you would be all four levels of interoperable according to this framework. And indeed, this is how most people in healthcare think about interoperability. Um, they're not necessarily checking these boxes, but if you have standards-based CSVs being shared over SFTP um, and everybody's legally sharing them, then um, you're interoperable and people think that that's good enough. Um, and this is just the mentality that's everywhere. So yes, while CSVs over SFTP are better than faxing and having to hire individual people to go fax um, all of your clinical and lab results, um, it's really not good enough. 
Um, because the prevailing notion of healthcare interoperability focuses on making data exchange electronic. Um, and data exchange and true interoperability and like the power of transformation that we can talk about is just so much more than that. Um, I'm at API days and I assume I'm preaching to the choir about why this isn't enough, um, but we're gonna, we're gonna get into this. So we're gonna back up a little bit first, talk about the journey to interoperability, um, how we got here going to go really fast. Um, maybe some people in the audience already know this, um, but we started with HL7 being created in 89. Um, we then, there's some independent efforts around electronic medical records and companies like Epic and Cerner um, starting to be installed at hospitals to start to digitize the healthcare workplace and workflows. Um, there are a lot of disparate systems happening, a lot of frustration in the environment. And so then in 2004, the creation of the op the creation of the Office of the National Coordinator of Health IT happened, um, also known as the ONC. And you'll probably hear this a lot, especially if you're in healthcare. Um, and the ONC was kind of the first move towards actually trying to have a concrete role of government in health IT governance and technology um, progress and advancement. And that was then built on later in 2009 through the High Tech Act, which establishes meaningful use and requires interoperable electronic health records. Um, also in 2009, the ONC issues fundings to states to create health information exchanges. Um, you can kind of think of these, and we're gonna see an example later, um, as the connectors. So say you, know, you, have a, you have one health information exchange, they have to be nonprofit, um, they'll have their own software. They're both an organization and a software. They might be using open source software. They might be using a company like Epic and their and their products. Um, and they are connecting all the different hospitals in the region who choose to connect and just getting data from them. So they are facilitating data exchange. Um, this has been have very varying levels of success. We're going to talk about that a bit more later. Um, in 2011, 2011, a couple things happened. Um, we get Medicare and Medicaid incentive programs for EHRs, now called promoting interoperability programs as of 2018, because um, interoperability is the big word. Um, also, in 2011, FIRE first started, um, which is pretty exciting. Uh, they didn't actually publish their first um, version in 2014, and that's also when the Project Argonaut launched. Um, and this is a multi-stakeholder partnership to advance FIRE. It brought a lot of the major private companies and some of the nonprofits to the table and got them to commit to pushing FIRE forward. Um, and that's been pretty successful so far. Um, in 2018, CMS also launches the Blue Button 2.0 FIRE API, which is one of the first and really canonical industry shaping examples of a FIRE API. Um, and then there's, we're going to talk about some more examples later. And then in 2020, this year, um, ONC and CMS issue the final, the final rule of the Cures Act. We're going to get into that later. So just a timeline to help keep things kind of grounded. Um, likewise, I also want to talk about the users and stakeholders in the healthcare ecosystem, um, primarily the patient. The patient is at the top of everything. Um, but there are so many other players and stakeholders in this industry, it's hard to keep track of them. And I'm sure this is not even an exhaustive list. Um, but really, I think the thing to keep in mind is that even if we're talking about interoperability between labs and their device manufacturers, the data that we're talking about is patient data. And the reason why we're here talking about it is to improve the health outcomes of patients. And so the patient really is the core to everything, even if they're not the direct beneficiary or direct user of their workflow. So what does this look like in a diagram? Um, from the 1990s, even to today, this is something that you could see. Super simplified example, um, but we have one patient, we have multiple health systems, including an independent clinician. Um, They're all exchanging data in different formats with custom on-prem integrations. Um, some things are still involved, paper and email. Most notably, everything to the patient is basically a web portal, fax or email or paper. Um, and that is true for many patients today. Um, so some of the problems, again, these are um, custom one-off integrations. These integrations are not real time. Um, the structure and the semantics are not shared between systems. There's a huge burden and a risk of bad data quality and consistency. The patient can't really access their own data in electronic or usable format. Um, and the focus on moving data between systems is so burdensome that it takes precedent over making data usable and actionable, resulting in multiple complex screens of information that providers end up ignoring. 
So I challenge you next time you go to a healthcare provider, ask to just watch their workflow, ask to just see what they're doing on their screen. Um, and nine times out of 10, you're gonna see some pretty, pretty grim UI and just an information overload because the builders were too busy focusing on data and not on workflow, and not on users. Um, so interoperability phase two, so enter fire, enter health information exchanges, enter these things called interface engines and the companies who provide them. Um, and we start to see some consolidation. Um, we start to see um, at least now companies are able to um, potentially just connect to one thing or connect to a couple things instead of doing a lot of, a lot of custom build. Um, HIEs and HINs, so health information exchanges and health information networks, are also adding the value of being a data store. So they are doing some normalization and cleaned up data. Um, this all allows more players to enter the market, which is exciting. It enables academics and researchers to have one place to go, or at least fewer places to go to get data they need to do good research. Um, and also, software developers and stakeholders can finally focus on adding value rather than exchanging data if they have fewer people to go to to get the data and they can hopefully get better data. Um, some problems, basically all the, all the problems still exist from before, um, especially now that um, you know, there is more interoperability, there's more connections and easier connections and faster connections, but we're still seeing that patients still can't get their own data in an electronic or machine readable format. Um, and that's just not acceptable in 2020. Um, we do see the interface engines, you know, these companies who are focused on basically building and selling APIs, um, they are providing some value and they're selling that value. Um, so, you know, that's that's good because they're starting to add to the structure and semantics. Um, it's kind of a bummer when they choose not to use Fire, um, but we're gonna talk about that in a second um, because some of them aren't using Fire and they're just kind of building proprietary APIs on top of the already difficult APIs. Um, but we're going to talk about that in a sec. So um, we have five minutes left, so I'm trying to go through this fast. Um, so how do we get from this interoperability ecosystem, this kind of messy ecosystem um, that has a very, in some ways, limited, but also expansive and maybe not lofty enough goal of interoperability to APIs? Um, and how do we leverage APIs change um, that benefits patients and ultimately transforms American healthcare. Well, uh, the first thing is to acknowledge that the 1990s aren't going anywhere anytime soon. Modernization takes time and investment. You know, these hospitals have already invested millions, if not billions, of dollars into their on-prem electronic health record systems that power, you know, some, you know, sometimes hundreds of thousands of patients a year. Um, and they're not going to be changing those anytime soon. Um, so we, while we modernize, this is going to be a long process. Um, but at the same time, we have to be investing in open standards-based infrastructure, like open source software and fire APIs, um, and just the concept of open standards in general. Um, you know, we have fire now, maybe in 20 years, we won't have fire, but we have to be focused on providing value and having open standards that we're all part of collaborating and adding to, um, to make sure that we can adapt when we want to change the standard and that we can make standards that are good for us, um, which is goes into another point I have later. Um, but this is going to take time and, you know, we're going to have to just make good progress um, as we start to shift the industry forward. Um, second, we have to refactor interoperability into API strategy. So we really shouldn't be using this word interoperability anymore. Um, even though I know I will continue to use it probably for a long time, but we have to change the conversation to be about API strategy. We have to talk about continuous API product development. We have to think about APIs and integrations as products. And we have to understand the why from the beginning to the end. It can't just be about data exchange. We have to understand how the data we're exchanging leads to data-driven goals and measures of success and real outcomes. And we have to make sure users are part of the cycle and that you know, providers are the ones who are owning their workflows and able to you know, help guide software development and product decisions that help empower them as opposed to burden them. And we have to make sure that patients are top and center for all the decisions that we're making, even if they're not a direct user of our product. Um, and we also have to acknowledge that discovery and promotion matter and we have to stop building silos and invest in developer experience um, so that we treat developers and the healthcare ecosystem as first class users too. 
Um, thirdly, we need to design standards with users, users being the implementers, um, FHIR is being increasingly adopted, learning from adoption, pretty excited about a lot of the work the FHIR community is doing and the multi-stakeholder groups that um, they've actively been forming to push the standards forward and getting use and adoption. Um, and then we also see CMS at the forefront and implementing APIs using these new FHIR standards and also collaborating and giving back to the FHIR community as they learn by doing. Um, this was one of the kind of criticisms for a while is that FHIR just isn't used like it should be. Um, and therefore, sometimes its design doesn't reflect learnings from actual use, but that is actively changing um, and people are using it and the FHIR community is uh, collaborating and connect thons are great. So um, finally, um, as we saw with interoperability, government was a driving force. Government made interoperability happen in an in ecosystem that was so against change and still is against change. Um, and just like it drove interoperability, it is driving APIs. So we just saw the Cures Act final rule come out, which mandates patient access APIs. It requires that patients can electronically access all of their electronic health information, structured or otherwise, at no cost. It requires that provide, there be a provider directory um, from your insurance companies so that you can um, have an API that exposes all the providers that you are in your network. Um, it mandates pair-to-pair -pair data exchange through standards um, and so much more. And we also see government bodies like CMS and the Department of Veterans Affairs making great API products that are standards and fire um, based and also in the cloud. Um, so it's really great to see government really pushing this forward. Um, and I know that they will continue to do so with the adoption and the implementation of APIs. So we are on the journey to better health outcomes and value for patients. And as I said at the beginning, for the American public, um, for healthcare in general, for the long run, and for the current pandemic situation we're in. And let's reach our destination, not through interoperability, but through user-focused, patient-centered, standards-based APIs. So. Thank you, and please come join me at USDS because we're great. Awesome. <laughs> I love it. Thanks, Shelby. Um, we don't really have time to take questions right now, but if you do have anything for uh, for Shelby, please reach out to her on Twitter or here in the app, um, and uh, I know she'll be very happy to help, uh, help answer your questions. Thanks again, Shelby. It's really good to see you, um, and maybe we can uh, catch up uh, sometime soon. Um, next up on this uh, on this uh, track is uh, the folks from Aircall. Um, Xavier and Raphael are going to talk about from product to marketplace with uh, Correct. APIs. Welcome how are you, to Russ? I'm very well. How are you? Pretty good. Pretty good. How are you? Where are you based? I'm in Denver. Oh, nice, nice. Yeah. Where are you guys? Uh, I'm actually based in New York, but I, I decided to go to uh, Florida to a uh, COVID capital, so I flew to uh, Florida. <laughs> I'm trying to get COVID, but uh, yeah, yeah get after, you know, surviving it in New York, <laughs> you're just going through the second wave of it all in Florida. That's a great strategy. Yeah. Correct. <laughs> awesome. All well, right. let's get stuck straight in. Um, I, uh, if you guys have slides to present, um, let's just make yes. sure that all works, and then I will pass it over to you. Can you guys see my screen now? Yes. Yes, we can. All right. So let's go ahead. Um, I guess we're going to do a Q&A session at the end. So we'll try to wrap everything up in 20 minutes. Uh, right. So first of all, uh, thanks, everybody, for uh, attending this talk. Uh, hopefully, you're going to like talking about product, marketplace, APIs, because uh, that's what this topic is going to be about. And we're going to talk about how, at Erco, we grew an ecosystem from 15 applications to more than 90 plus application in less than three years. So first of all, I uh, just want to introduce you, Raphael, who's going to be presenting this hey. talk with me today. Uh, he's the uh, manager of the app ecosystem and myself, I'm Xavier. I'm uh, the co-founder of Erkel on the technical part. And now I'm a uh, dev rel at Erkel. Real quick, uh, Erkel is a uh, cloud-based phone system for sales and support team. Uh, we are integrated with all like kind of business business tools that companies are using, like Salesforce, Slack, uh, Intercom, et cetera. Uh, and qu some quick metrics on this. We have now more than 5,000 customers, uh, 350. We raised around $100 million in less than six years, and we're still doing a 2x year uh, over year growth uh, at our stage, which is pretty cool. And we just raised the, uh, the Series C's like a month ago, I think. 
on the mission of the products, uh, that's going to be important for this talk. So that's why I'm talking about it right now. Um, but the first step of uh, our mission is to build the best phone system ever. So we want something to be easy to set up, simple to use, but really powerful. So that's what we've been doing for six years. And now we're going to add the second step of the product. And we've been working on this for actually a few years now. Uh, the second step is the integration part um, with the ecosystem for voice. So we want to have like the, uh, the phone integrated with all the tools. Uh, once again, like all the CRMs, all, all the help desk, et cetera. And the third step of the record chip is what we're calling the augmented conversation. So think of uh, cultural transcription, sentiment analysis, etc. And today, of course, we're going to focus on voice as an integration. So the ecosystem for voice and what we're doing and the different steps we've done to build this ecosystem for voice. So this talk is going to be in three different parts. The first part uh, is how we put strapped the ecosystem back in 2015. Second part is how we got our first partners building things on top of us. And the third step is today, uh, how we scaled uh, the marketplace and the next step we're going to do. So let's start, let's get started with uh, how we bootstrap uh, the ecosystem. Uh, funnily, our code is actually built on top of different platforms like Twilio, Voxbone, Stripe, AWS, etc. So like building an ecosystem is actually part of our DNA. We are part of a bigger, um, a bigger ecosystem with AWS and Twilio. So we wanted to like be part of this and uh, uh, a, um, able like give the possibility to people to actually build things on top of us. So back in 2015, we understood that uh, business tools needed to be integrated together. And at that time, the phone was not integrated with anything. The phone was only a big black uh, old box uh, put on your uh, desktop and was not integrated with any of the tools you were using. And also, when you integrate your uh, tool with all the other tools out there, um, it actually increased the customer retention and bring like more uh, customers to um, to your product thanks to the others marketplace. But like building this ecosystem was not as easy as we thought, and that's like the baby Xavier like five years ago who thought that it was super easy to do, but actually it's not. So we had a few challenges. The first one is. Uh, we only had actually 50 customers, which was not a lot at all. Uh, and nobody knew us, of course. The use case of the platform and the product we built was very limited. Uh, we started building this product in 2014, so only one year ago before having this kind of vision. And last but not least, we had no public API. And actually, like having no public API was maybe the only thing I could start fixing. So we jumped on that problem right away, and we start building an API. So in May 2015, we released the very first version of our public API with very basic features to create, read, update, and delete the main resources available on Erkel. And we were like super excited and super proud of it. So I actually called my mom. I told her the story of the public API. She did not understand anything, uh, but she was like super excited. And just like our customers, actually, who were also super excited because they started using the public API as a new feature to build custom analytics. Uh, they build like integration with their custom CRM. Uh, and also like they started customize their own workflow thanks to the public API. So that was like a good challenge for us and we got people excited to use it. The second step is we actually used this public API to build our first integration. So all the integration that you can see that you can see on the screen here were built by us. Uh, we built the Salesforce integration, the HubSpot integration, the Zapier, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and we built that thanks to our public API. That was really, really good. Uh, that was a really good exercise for us because it allows us, allowed us to create some sort of framework um, that we were able to reuse then to just like create more and more integrations. And then in 2017, the magic happens. We got our first partner built application with people with from Pysing, Gorgias, Customer, and NoCRM. They were using the public API that we built uh, in some like hacky way, let's say, to make their integration work. The only thing is that we didn't have any structure to help them. Like we didn't have any um, tutorial or resources available. We didn't have any marketplace at that time. But it was pretty like powerful for them because it allowed them to bring a phone, like the phone feature, in their products. And thanks to that, we got some business in return. So that was pretty, pretty cool. 
So actually, now that we had the first partners in 2017, I kind of allowed myself to start a dream like, what if someone could build a business on top of us at some point? That would be amazing. Just like Erco was built on top of AWS, Twilio, Voxbone, etc. Why not having someone at some point building a business on top of us? And that's something that Raphael is going to talk about right after. But before jumping on uh, that part, uh, just want to share with you some lesson that we learned on that very specific moment of the journey. The first one is do it yourself. Um, do it yourself and start building the integration by yourself. So that's going to showcase ki uh, kind of your products. Uh, and also you can be present on their marketplace. Like the Salesforce marketplace is a very, very good tool to get some traction out of it. Second uh, lesson is never say no. So let the partners hack your public API. They will bring you business and features you don't have time to build, just like PySync, which is the very first partner we had. They built a contact sync between Erco, the product, and whatever other products you want to use. So we're never going to build a contact sync feature. PySync did it for us. And the last one is don't forget that an API is an interface. That is really important. So you want to have as many features available on your products inside your API. So each features available in your product must be or should be inside your API as well. That's for me something that is really important. And in SaaS, don't forget that developers are users of the product, not only paying customers. So now that we saw all of that, let's see how we got like traction from uh, more and more partners. Thank you, Xavier. Yeah, so how did we get uh, to that second stage where partners were building application on top of us. Well, first, we needed to define a vision uh, around that. Uh, as, as we mentioned, we didn't really have, uh, it was a surprise that partners built an integration on top of us. And so we set that milestone, that kind of symbolic milestone for Airflow, uh, where during those uh, product uh, updates, product meetings, we said, uh, we need to get to a hundred plus integration. And it shouldn't be, all of those integrations built by Airco, we should actually reverse the trend where in the past we had 13 integrations built by Airco, two by partners or something like this. We need to go to 70% of our integrations built by our partners, by developers, and the rest that we host and maintain. And so we started to go on that journey and went to bootstrap that 100 plus integration vision again. Um, so the first thing we did is map out the whole ecosystem of partners we could integrate with. We were a SaaS product in telephony. You can understand the jobs to be done with telephony. You can understand the companies in the space. And so we did this big Excel spreadsheet, uh, maps all the companies that we think we could be partner with. And we went out, actually went out and reached out uh, to thousands of companies seeing how we could partner. So identifying the right companies, but classifying them was important. So we broke the companies into different categories. Um, when you think about integration with a SaaS product, you can think about the different tools that people use and how do these tools could interact together. So even from scratch, it's fairly easy to categorize different products in various categories and then pitch the value of an integration between those two products or ads that could be built. Uh, of course, some categories were more mature than others. And so we had a prioritization framework. Uh, prioritization framework based on the size of the companies we were reaching out to, the overlap between our customer base, or the assumed overlap, the go-to-market that we had in common, the maturity of their partnership program, how willing we, would, we were thinking that they would be to build with us, and also their broader software category, because we knew that our API wasn't fully equipped to handle all of the use cases we had in mind, and we still had things to develop on the product. So we went out, we started doing outbound, and we kind of like, uh, did things that don't really uh, scale at this stage to get our first uh, partners to build on top of us. Second, um, as we did that motion of outbound, we tried to create replicable use cases. Our API was still very much customer focused rather than partner uh, external developer focused. Uh, and so we wrote down guides, even PDFs for best practices on how to do a CRM and help desk integration as being a phone. That was the main category. And so we tried to advertise that uh, synthesize what uh, developers were already doing that worked really, really well. And we also wrote stories, marketing stories, uh, about our journey with some of these partners. Gorgeous customer that we're really proud that they started integrating with us years ago that are still very good partners of ours. Uh, we wrote stories to explain to the ecosystem uh, why they found value in API, why our products integrated together. Okay, uh, and so from a business perspective, that's how we approached it. But then 
Uh, we also noticed that there were gaps in the product in the API, and we tried to fill that out. One thing, for instance, is that these partners in the CRM and help desk categories were using webhooks. Webhooks with telephony are really useful because they allow you to get real-time information about calls. Uh, and so these webhooks couldn't be created through the API. You had to set them manually, which is not acceptable for a partner. So that's like message that you see here. That's back then when we released that ability to create webhooks with the API. And that uh, is something uh, that partners still use today. Um, Partners wanted to be listed in uh, what we call the Airfall dashboard, where you install your integration as the same level as the integration we built. And we didn't have the ability to do that with basic authentication with API keys. So we integrated the standard on the market, which is OAuth, and now everybody can integrate apps with Airfall in one click. So we improved the backend, we improved the structure, but we also thought from a product perspective, how can we make our phone more integrated? And so we created frameworks like the inside card. Uh, so the inside card is a framework that allows you to push information to Airfall in real time. And that's clearly made the CRM use case better because then I can get contact information in my phone as soon as I make an outbound call, or I receive an inbound phone call. Uh, and so we thought what made us successful in the beginning? Well, it was to showcase to the market, showcase to developers what could be done. And we said, well, can we show the market that the phone system can actually integrate with a very popular platform, which is Shopify? No one was connecting a phone to Shopify at the time. And what we did is that we pulled other information from Shopify and we sent it uh, to the phone in that kind of productized framework. We, we got a lot of inspiration from Slack on the framework, actually, um, where, uh, let's say, I'm a customer service agent at an e-commerce company and you're calling me. I don't have to ask you a bunch of information about who you are. I know who you are. I know what you bought at my store, and I can help you really quickly and have more engaged human conversations with you. And that helped us showcase the broader scope of possibilities to the SaaS ecosystem, to the developers, through a product framework. Now, uh, doing this uh, with the product and the business, we hit a few milestones that I'm very happy and proud to be able to share here. First, we launched our marketplace. Uh, the marketplace, it's not just a website. It's not just a tool uh, that, that you have there to promote your partners. It's actually the platform where your customers, your partners will interact and will connect. So this is where you're going to drive value to developers from your SaaS products to your customers. And, and it's really important that you grow the marketplace, that you grow the features of the marketplace as you scale the number of apps that join, uh, that join it. It's also a great tool for your team to understand, like, now we have apps coming out every other week. And so it's important to have the marketplace to centralize it. Um, another thing, and then uh, I think Zev will be really, really happy to share that, is that we had the first business uh, built on top of Airflow. So Phil uh, from Postcall uh, identified a gap in our offering uh, and said, there is no way to simply send surveys after a call in Airflow. And I want to build a company to do that. So when a phone call ends, I can get that information and send out the surveys based on some criteria. And so now it's thriving on the marketplace and we have the first company built on top of Airco, but developers will be able to build more and more. And that's the motion uh, we're gonna try to replicate, which is first, we're gonna have companies that we're gonna integrate with. Second, uh, attracting third party partners that are gonna build on top of us, others that companies, and then let developers create product new experiences as we extend our customer base and our capabilities. Uh, so that's our journey in a nutshell. Uh, you can see the growth on the on the graph here, uh, and we're pretty proud of this. But especially the fact that there are so many different categories, uh, um, and that uh, there's more and more uh, growing over time. So um, so really, uh, that's how we bootstrapped it. But now uh, most of these partners that you see on the far end of the graph, they come to us because they want to build integration and they want to join the marketplace. So despite starting with a lot of outbound and things that don't really scale. We reversed the trend and now are able to get some demand for people to build on top of us because the company grew and because we, we built an attractive platform. Uh, but it's it's not over and there's a lot we're gonna do to scale further. Uh, Xavier is gonna explain that, but first, some lessons. Do things that don't scale, that's the motto that you all know. If you know where you wanna take the vision and if you know how you're gonna scale it in the end, don't be afraid to do a bit of manual stuff. I did a lot of that. Uh, but uh, you can you can uh, improve that as you go with technology. Um, second uh, is the Lego box. I think we really see that in the way we build frameworks in the product. 
bundle what you see working with customers, with partners into frameworks that are really, really easy to use and control the user experience as you grow so that partners and customers get a better uh, outcome out of this. Um, the last one is Be Bold. Uh, we had companies like Microsoft Teams, Typeform, uh, Job Adder, which is a great applicant tracking system, the same size as us uh, in uh, 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 Australia, building uh, integration onto us. And so don't think that because you're starting, nobody will want to uh, build on top of your API. That's not true. If your product has value, if your API has value, uh, and there are some people that have a roadmap against that, you can match it and uh, uh, you can be ambitious in the partnerships you create. All right. So now that we've seen uh, how we can like bring this ecosystem together, let's see how we can bring this ecosystem to the next level. So what are uh, our current challenges right now? So first off, I just wanted to share this news that I uh, just joined the uh, ecosystem and the marketing team. So I was uh, part of the engineering team for six years. Uh, I built the first version of Oracle. I grew the engineering team from zero to 50 people. And now I'm actually switching gears and I'm going in the marketing team to help uh, this entire ecosystem strategy because I really think that it's key for us. And if we don't build the proper API, if we don't have the proper resources around it, we won't be able to grow as far as we want as a company. So joining the uh, marketing team with a new role, which is DevRel, and I'm going to try to kickstart all these initiatives at Aircall. So really excited about that. Then we are here to help developers. So one of the first thing we've done this year was to build a brand new website, a developer website with tons of different resources. We wrote so many tutorials. Uh, we revamped our entire API references documentation. So I'm really, really proud of the work that the team have done here. Uh, that's quite impressive what they've uh, been building actually. But now we have a brand new website with tons of documentation for developers, for partners, oriented for partners, so they can actually build application on top of us really easily. Uh, and of course, uh, when you do something for the devs, you want to bring a dark mode. So that's kind of an Easter egg that we built, uh, and we had so much fun to, uh, to do this. One of the last thing initiative that we are launching, and that's something that we're launching this week, actually, it's the Echo Lab. So that's an uh, internal initiative where we want to kind of drive uh, innovation on top of our public API. So we, as Echo, we are going to use our public API and all the tools that we're giving to partners and developers to build free application that we're going to bring onto our own marketplace. So this one uh, is the first one. It's, it's the uh, weather app. Just uh, super simple. We are displaying the weather uh, to the customer you are in call with um, inside the phone. So that's kind of a way to hack the phone super easily. And we're using the all the public products that we're giving to partners. Some lesson learns uh, care. The first one is care about your developer experience. If the developer experience is great, then all the developers will know you and you will become kind of the uh, go-to platform to build things uh, on top of. And that's really exciting and you're gonna get more and more partners. Second one is listen to your partners. So actually paying customers are not the only users of your products. Make sure that the partners voice is represented uh, internally. So every time you have a meeting with salespeople, salespeople or marketing people, or product people, make sure to talk about the partners. That's really important for me, from me. And the last one, maybe the most important thing of this entire presentation, it's keep innovating. That's something that is really important to me. Use all the tools that you are giving to people to see how far you can push your product and how far you can push your company. So today we talked about the second stage of the rocket ship, which was voice as an integration. Um, but actually like all the integrations can be present in the three stages of the company. So if you want to build a best phone system, you're going to need integration. If you want to have augmented conversation, you're going to need uh, integration as well. So if you guys want to build anything with us, uh, you're more than welcome to uh, reaching out to Rafael uh, or myself. And thank you so much for uh, your time today. So happy to take any question if there's any. Um, otherwise, have a great day. Yeah, Thanks, no, everyone. I, thank you, guys. I really appreciate it. I think you know, looking at the over the past uh, couple of years just with this integration strategy, and congrats on a fantastic C round <laughs> recently as well. I bet, um, I bet that the, the integration strategy played a pretty big role in uh, in driving your valuation, your success over the past uh, few quarters. So, congrats. Thanks. Uh, 
the uh, maybe just one one quick question like you you touched on developer experience a few times um like how, how have you started how have you like built for developer experience keeping that top of mind what are some of the things you did to try and um emphasize developer experience just to sort of guide people that are going through this process so maybe two things that are on top of my mind right now the first one being um we have simple resources in the Oracle product, one being the users, the teams, the number, the calls, and you want to make sure that developers understand the relationship to, of all those resources together, right? So actually we built, uh, like the API reference is really well written because when you read it, you actually understand all the relationship together. So that's one thing. You just want to make sure that kind of your database is really simple to use and simple to uh, read as a developer. Second thing is, uh, what we share today, the inside card, which is some sort of framework. So as a developer, I don't have to care about the user experience of the end user. I just have to use one API endpoint, and that's going to be inside the phone with different metrics and different information in it. So you just have to use one endpoint, format your JSON, and then you have the uh, Echo user uh, experience, which is pretty pretty simple. And Slack actually, so as Rafael was saying, uh, Slack did the same thing. So whenever you want to send a message, you just have to use one endpoint and then you have the same message all the time. And uh, yeah, I think one thing as well is, is uh, as, as Xavier mentioned at the end, um, um, supporting developers at any stage. Uh, so being there to enter, we try to reduce the distance between our company and the developers so that as a developer, you don't get roadblocks. If you're writing to us, if you're developing something with us, uh, we're trying to help you as fast as possible. Uh, with a very advanced product and technical uh, people. Uh, and we try to scale that as much as we can uh, as we grow the company uh, so that you can uh, keep that experience on par and not just talk to a wall. That's a lot of sense, for sure. Well, thank you very much, gentlemen. Thanks, Rafa. Thanks, Xavier. Stay safe in Florida. <laughs> thanks, Ross. Um, and thanks, everybody that's joined us for the, the last of this session. And we're going into a general session now, so um, we'll see everybody there. And thanks again. See you there. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Bye. -bye.